A Sermon of Martin Luther for Invocavit Sunday, the first Sunday in Lent, preached in the year 1534. The text for this sermon comes from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and sheweth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. In this gospel we learn that the Lord Jesus, after his baptism, was tempted three times, after having spent forty days and forty nights in the wilderness without food, or, as Luke reports it, these three temptations continued throughout the forty days, and Jesus was harried by one or the other for a period of days, and perhaps not in the same order recorded by Matthew. However, it is a comprehensive gospel, particularly when applied to all Christendom which also experiences trials like Christ, by hunger and persecution, by heresy, and finally by the kingdoms of this world, as the histories devoted to the subject also well document. But on this occasion we shall not deal in a far-ranging way with temptation, but as it is commonly understood. So first, We want to note and learn from the example of our dear Lord Christ that every Christian, as soon as he's baptized, is marshaled into an army in confrontation with the devil, and from his baptism onward is saddled with the devil who harasses him as long as he lives. If this bitter enemy cannot by his onslaughts get the better of Christians and bring about their downfall, he seeks to hang them on the cross and kill them as he did Christ. All Christians face such attack, for the adversary never relents but continues to try to wrench us away from Christ and our baptism, by means of hunger or persecution, by worldly fame and wealth, or by heresy or false interpretation of scriptures, so that we give way to despair and vain glory. If such tricks fail, the devil tries to get us by the throat and strangle us to death. We can learn from Christ's encounter with Satan how to deal with and overcome this adversary so that he's forced to let us go. However, this happens only through true faith in God and his word. Whoever thus arms himself properly will be able to withstand the devil, but whoever fails to do so will certainly be helpless against this deadly adversary. It is the bounden duty, therefore, of every Christian to earnestly hear God's word and its preaching diligently learn and become well-versed therein. We also should persevere in earnest prayer that God would let his kingdom come among us, not lead us into temptation, but graciously deliver us from evil. Now, the evangelist says that the Lord Jesus was led away by the Spirit into the wilderness, for since there was no master over him, who could demand things of him? The Holy Spirit directed him into the wilderness. The evangelist wants especially to caution us to be on guard against self-imposed devotion, since Christ did not go into the wilderness by an act of his own will or resolve to wrestle there with the devil, as many and sundry people do with mandate of God's word or spirit. In no way ought this happen, 
No one should seek after self-chosen avenues of service to God unless so enjoined by God, either by God's word or by persons whom God has placed in authority over him. Whoever undertakes things like this without a proper call, as do the monks and nuns who run the cloisters, not only does God a disservice, but also contravenes genuine obedience to him. It is well, therefore, for us to reflect on this example of Christ. He did not go into the wilderness of his own accord, but was led there by the Holy Spirit. Accordingly, we should respond in similar manner, not prompted merely by our own ideas of religion, but in faithful conformity and obedience to the word of God in all that we do. This is a teaching you have often heard repeated, to be sure that God has commanded whatever you do, and to do nothing extraneous to his work. With respect to ordinary duties and works of love, no new commandment is necessary. We have these expressed in the Ten Commandments. There the Lord enjoins everybody to hear his word, to love him, and pray and call upon him. Doing these things is God's will, as he requires in the first three commandments. God also commands obedience to father and mother, not to kill, and not to commit adultery, but to marry. All this is by God's ordering and command. For this reason, we need not look for the Holy Spirit's prompting to be a father or mother, to enter the estate of matrimony, and so on, for such commands already exist. But to institute something special as service to God, like entering a cloister or fasting by foregoing meat, eggs, and butter, or refraining from singing hallelujahs while fasting, there is no commands in God's word. Therefore, such things are really nothing but sacrilege in God's sight and not true worship. But now let us consider in turn each of Christ's temptation. The first occurred when the devil, seeing the Lord Jesus hunger, says to him, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. This temptation does not appear to us to be so very serious, for we reason like this. How could that have harmed Christ? He could easily have made bread out of stones. He had already done much greater miracles. But the reason he does not want to do it is this. He knows very well what the devil is after and that he is not particularly interested in Jesus performing a miracle. Rather, as we see from Christ's reply, Satan wanted very much to rob him of faith and reliance on God's loving kindness and to prompt the thought in his heart, God has forgotten you. He's indifferent to your needs. He's willing to let you die of hunger, begrudging you even a piece of bread. That is why the Lord answers, Away, devil, not so. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So the devil's prompting is this. Your only concern is for bread. Forget about God's word. Bread is what you need. This sort of temptation is still with us today. The devil still puts such thoughts into people's hearts like, If you are a child of God, God cannot be angry with you. Let us keep on hoarding and being covetous. Let's meddle to our heart's content into the affairs of the world. No harm is done. You are not sinning if you do, for if God does not want to give nourishment and bread, he must be a bad God and a merciless father. By such promptings, the devil makes scoundrels out of burglars and peasants, convincing them to go on hoarding and being greedy, and to thinking that God will not become angry about it, since after all, it has to do with daily bread and sustenance. I must, everyone thinks, take care of wife and child and provide for them, and so on. Thus, by saying that you are a child of God, the devil puts a lid over sin, by implying that as such you cannot sin or do what is wrong. Everywhere in the world we see that people are not conscience-stricken. They do not pay attention to the world, but are only concerned with bread and sustenance. So this temptation is still very much in the world. The devil makes the word appear of little value and forces people to pay more attention to bread than to it. We must recognize this and learn to overcome this temptation by saying, Satan, you would like very much to tear me away from the word, but you will not succeed. Before I starve for want of the word of God, I would rather do without bread and die of hunger. For it is better for the body to perish than for it to be kept alive by food and the soul to die and be lost forever. The devil is not happy to have us think this way and so maneuvers things by setting it that we always have a full stomach. 
tempting us to despise God's word and to think, no want exists, God is my father, will he begrudge me bread and sustenance? If you want to guard yourself against such temptations, learn from Christ here that there are two kinds of bread. The first and best bread which comes down from heaven is the word of God. The second and of lesser benefit is the temporal bread which comes forth from the earth. If I now have the first and best bread, the heavenly bread, and allow nothing to deter me from partaking of it, I am confident that temporal bread will also not be lacking, even if it takes stones to be made into bread. Those, however, who are overcome by the devil, give up the heavenly bread, and feed only upon the temporal, will find that having filled up their stomachs, they must lie down and die. Having refused to feed on the good bread here, they must leave it behind and suffer eternal hunger there. But it does not have to be this way. If the devil is assailing you through persecution, want, hunger, and affliction, suffer it and fast with Christ, since it is the Spirit who directs you, and do not let up on your trust in God's grace. In time the angels will come and wait on your table, as the evangelist says in his concluding word. The first lesson as regards the internal temptation is that we must learn to value God's word as highly as we do eternal life. For it is the kind of food and nourishment that bestows eternal life upon everyone who eats of it, that is, believes it. Just as Christ says to the Jews in John 6, 27, Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. Mark this well. Temporal bread, on the other hand, after which the whole world scrapes and scratches, endures only until the last crumb is eaten and then everlasting hunger sets in. In the second temptation, the devil leads the Lord Jesus into the holy city of Jerusalem, sets him on the parapet of the temple, and says that he should throw himself down, suggesting that no harm would befall him. For he is the Son of God, and surely the angels would come to assistance before he would ever strike his foot against a stone. This is a very severe spiritual temptation for faith, in which faith is assailed with regards to God's grace in the same way it was assailed above as regards to sin and God's wrath. For if the devil cannot cause us to despair of God's benevolence, he brazenly tries next to see whether he can make us proud and reckless enough to rely on our own righteousness. It is as though the devil were saying to Christ, If you want to argue with me from God's word, hold on, I'm able to do that also. Listen, here's the word of God. He will put his angels in charge of you, ordering them to provide a shoot for you and carry you into their arms. So jump off and let's see whether you believe that promise of God. Here you must look upon Christ as a human being who kept his Godhead concealed in his humanity. Just as on the cross he shows that he is a real human being, grieving and crying for help and deliverance. As the one whom Satan has filled with sorrow, so he shows himself here also as a true man. For this reason the devil believes he can bring him to the point where he can tempt God to perform an unnecessary miracle. He cites Psalm 91.11 in testimony, yet he leaves out the most relevant part. In this to us. The Lord will keep you in all thy ways. With this passage, the scoundrel tries to perplex Christ and to lead him to do what God had not ordained. For Christ is now in the wilderness as a human being, not for the purpose of performing miracles, but to suffer. Thus, the devil tries to direct him from the way God ordained for him to walk, namely, to be a human being facing temptation and induce him to perform an unnecessary miracle. But Christ repulses him and says, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. For there is a good staircase there, and no need for me to hurl myself down, because I am able to descend via the steps without danger. It would be wrong for me unnecessarily and without command of God to endanger myself and jump down. This is also a needful and beneficial lesson. For... It is called tempting God when a person renounces the ordinary command and, in defense of the word of God, contrives something new and different, as monks and nuns do. They are motivated by their self-chosen notions 
and propose to live a special kind of life, claiming on the basis of Scripture that Christ ordained it when he said, Forsake all and follow me. Both reason and Scripture lend support for their argument, but you see here that the devil too is able to quote Scripture and deceive people with it. But he becomes guilty of prevarication when he does not quote all of Scripture, but quotes only what serves his devious purpose. He leaves out what doesn't serve and remains quiet about the rest. The Anabaptists do the same thing. They quote a lot of scriptures to the effect that one should not trust in anything that is created. Then, they argue, baptism is also a created thing, for it is nothing but water. Therefore, one should not put any trust in nor rely on baptism. They refuse to believe that God's grace is in baptism, but blindly feel their way about. It's not that they don't have the scripture, but they fail to interpret it correctly. For if the word of God did not state as follows, John 3, 5, except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God, it would be wrong to seek God's grace in baptism or in the water. But God's word stands firm. Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. For faith and baptism, word and water, must abide together. This, however, the blind don't want to see. Accordingly, Christ contests what the devil has said, When I walk the way God has commanded me, I know that angels are with me, and that they will wait upon me. Thus also, in the case of an obedient child, or a father, mother, or domestic servant, going about the routine tasks of their calling, if a mishap befalls them, God will, through his angels, help and deliver them. But if they depart from the right way, the angels will not be there, and the devil can then at any moment break their necks, if God permits. And it will serve them right, for they should not be creating new, self-designed ways, for that is called tempting God. This is a temptation which no one understands except the one who has been there and been tempted. For just as the first temptation leads to despair, this one leads to audacity and to rash actions that contravene God's word and command. A Christian needs to take the middle road so that he neither despairs nor becomes arrogant, for both are contrary to the word of God. He should instead continue in all sincerity with the word, in true faith and trust. Thus the angels will be with him. Otherwise, not. The third temptation involves tratidio humana, setting human traditions and doctrines above the word of God. It is a vile temptation by which Satan impudently offers temporal honor and power, trying to lead us into idolatry contrary to the word of God. It helps that outward human righteousness has such a tremendous appeal to reason and glitters far more enchantingly than does obedience to God's word, obedience to father and mother, and doing what God commands him to do. This still will not gain him the kind of respect he gets when he dons a monk's drab garb, adopts a lifestyle different from the people, eats no meat, and so forth. Briefly, such man-made show of piety has such strong appeal that emperors and kings reverently bow down before it. With this self-centered and self-convened spirituality, the Pope has become presumptuous to the point that he and his crowd do not want to act and be like other people because that is too contemptible. That Joseph obeyed his father Jacob does not dazzle the senses, for other upright children do the same thing. Thus it is too ordinary and common. But there is something spectacular to it when a person enters a cloister, when a monk or a nun and our Lord God become, as they boast, mutual co-workers, as they disdain gold and possessions and withdraw from the world. Monastery life has been extolled, but the fact is, as everyone knows, that there's another side to it. Christ calls it a severe and devilish temptation, and he shows us what such traditiones humanae and doctrines of men are, namely, doctrines of the devil, stating that they are serving and worshipping the devil with their misguided self-righteousness. Get thee hence. Christ says to the devil, for people are not to serve you, but God only. If a person does not serve God only, he must be serving the devil. 
But what does it mean to serve God? Serving God means to do what God has commanded in his word. If you are a child, then you must honor your father and mother. If you are a domestic, you should be obedient and faithful. If you are a master or mistress, do not provoke your servants by either word or deed. Do what your calling requires of you and walk in the fear of God. This means that we are to serve God and his word and not our own passions. For we have his word and commandments on this. Let the world call serving masters or mistresses, father or mother, neighbors or children, whatever it wants. It is still true worship of God. For God has written it into his word relative to my neighbor. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That the Pope now disregards this commandment and attributes a special type of holiness to it when a man puts on a gray hood, when he fasts and eats no butter or meat but only oil and fish, that is sheer deviltry, pure and simple. They think they thereby are serving God, but actually it is serving the devil, for it is not supported by God's command and word. In fact, this harmonizes with the righteousness that avails before God as little and does a house constructed by children out of a pile of cards become a building constructed of stone. The fact is that you cannot serve God unless you have his word and command. If his word and command are not there, you are not serving God, but your own will. Our Lord God's response to this is... Then let the one whom you serve reward you. For what devil has commanded you to do this? I command you to serve father and mother, your superiors and your neighbors. But this you disdain, and in the meantime do what I have not commanded. Am I to tolerate such disobedience? No, is out, it is out of the question. Therefore, the Pope and his followers, by reason of their attribute in life, are idolaters and servants of the devil. For he does not trouble himself about God's word. Yes, he condemns and persecutes the word, and by his diabolic artifice leads people away from the true faith in Christ. Under the semblance of divine worship, which he has established with books and tonsures, with fasting, eating of fish, reading masses, and whatever else, he displays great sanctity, but basically it is diabolical doctrine. You wonder, perhaps, why the Pope and his followers hold so strictly to such devilish doctrines? The Gospel lesson answers this for you. Satan has promised them the kingdoms of this world. This shows how he scorns our preaching and worship of God, for as a result of it we are beggars and have to suffer much. But the worship of himself the Pope elevates to the heavens, for from it he has achieved wealth, prosperity, honor, and power, and has become a lord mightier than emperor and king. We see here how by this temptation the devil has embedded himself so solidly among them and driven them to the point where they have abandoned God's word and have fashioned and introduced a self-fabricated righteousness. Yet amid this satanic specter, God has preserved a remnant few. We must face up to the devil and tell him the words of Christ. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. In other words, we should look solely to God's word, follow it, and pursue no other worship than what the word teaches. As long as we live, we can expect all three of these temptations. We must, therefore, gird ourselves well with God's word in order to protect and sustain ourselves. May Christ, our dear Lord, who himself overcame these temptations for our good, give us also the strength through him to overcome and to be saved. Amen.